Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining our uh, IT Best Practice Series webinar. Uh, I'm Subhu Viswanathan, uh, VP of IT Infrastructure, and uh, I will be presenting along with Les Jordan, the Chief uh, Technology Strategist for, uh, for Microsoft uh, in the Life Sciences. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a frog in my throat today. Uh, the discussion uh, will cover some introductions, uh, webinar logistics, direction for post-webinar collaboration on the topic, so we could discuss uh, the topic a little more. And then uh, we'll cover the, uh, the discussion topic itself, uh, life sciences in the cloud, specifically Office 365, et cetera. Quick introductions. Um, uh, some of you may already know me from the uh, past webinars we've had at the at USDM. Um, I have 15 years of uh, technology and compliance experience in the uh, uh, regulated life science domain. Um, I lead the IT infrastructure practice for USDM, and I'm an SME for VMware and SharePoint. Les, uh, Les Jordan is the CTO for Microsoft's life sciences team. Uh, he brings uh, the architectural, technical, and industry-specific guidance to internal product teams partner companies, and uh, Microsoft's largest pharma and health products enterprise customers. He brings over 15 years of industry experience, setting the technical direction and strategy. And he's also the director of the BioIT Alliance. <clears throat> USDM uh, is focused exclusively in the life science domain, uh, with a market leader providing IT quality regulatory compliance professional service solutions. We're headquartered out of Ventura, California, and we're a compliance partner for many best-of-breed vendors in the life science space. We've delivered more than 1,000 successful projects with over 130 satisfied life science customers, and uh, we're the preferred c compliance partner for small, mid-tier, as well as large life science companies. We specialize in assisting clients with uh, reducing regulatory risk while maximizing their investment in quality systems, content management systems, lab systems, et cetera, and IT infrastructure as well. Um, USDM is all about performance as well as compliance. Um, our, uh, our motto or our tagline is to simplify, unify, and optimize compliance. Um, so that's a quick intro to uh, USDM management. Quickly getting into the <coughs> webinar logistics. Uh, the content will be... Uh, Try, you know, we'll try and cover the content in about 30 minutes. This is a lot of information as well. Um, then we'll invite you to post some questions. Please post questions via the uh, message board at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can uh, send your questions to me. Uh, you can private chat to me. <clears throat> or you can join our discussion, uh, even post the, uh, the webinar on, our, uh, on LinkedIn, and you can post questions there. And I, uh, you know, I'll filter through the questions in less, and I will answer them. Um, to the best of our abilities. If you're having issues logging onto the system, uh, I suggest you turn off your pop-up blockers. Uh, sometimes that poses an issue. The overall goal of the webinar is to facilitate discussion, share ideas, uh, provide the, uh, the baseline platform, and then uh, we can explore solutions together. Moving on to the uh, meat of the webinar, it's going to be in two phases. Uh, Les will introduce uh, Microsoft 365 for Life Sciences, um, and I will further discuss uh, compliance over the cloud uh, more broadly, uh, delving into a particular recent case study uh, of an engagement that we had. Uh, note that uh, this is a precursor to uh, future webinars, and uh, if some of you have been to our past webinars, you, you would have noticed a trend in a series. Uh, I encourage you to visit our uh, past recorded webinars as well. Um, we will be having a, a future in-depth uh, walkthrough of a sample risk assessment uh, that USDA performed for a, a software as a service vendor. Uh, yeah, that'll, uh, you know, we'll send out mailers about that shortly. Uh, and now I'm going to turn over the presentation to, to Les. Well, thank you. You know, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak today on the topic of Office 365 in life sciences. Now, notice there is slight change in the title there. This is not Office 365 for Life Sciences. Uh, we do not have a particular offering for Life Sciences, but rather, as, as with all things Microsoft, we take a, a, a horizontal platform and really think about how it can be used in vertically specific ways. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Office 365 
and the ways that you can use it uh, generically and horizontally. And then we'll look at a few different possible use cases where companies have been starting to uh, employ Office 365 and the kinds of things that you could do with it in the, the life sciences. And so with that, um, you know, this slide used to read the future of productivity, but really is uh, the now of productivity. <laughs> it's, uh, our, our thinking of the world is uh, three screens, um, and people are operating in that way. You have your phone. Your phone has access, uh, my Windows phone, as I'm looking at it now, has access to uh, Outlook. It has access to SharePoint. It has access to Office. It has access to OneNote. It has access to Word. I could even take my phone and run a PowerPoint presentation on the phone with animation. Um, so we have your phone, you have your PC, you have browsers, uh, you have other uh, types of form factors, slates and tablets um, that are running Windows. And so you have the ability to have this productivity user interface that is now ubiquitous on the front end and ubiquitous on the back end. So you can have it either on-premises or on the cloud. You can host your own SharePoint, you can host your own Exchange, you can host your own link, or you can do that in a cloud service. And then we think of these things and these capabilities, these productivity capabilities across five areas of unified communications, uh, business intelligence, uh, content management, collaboration, and, uh, and search. So if we think about Microsoft Office 365, what is it? It's Office Professional Plus. It's Exchange Online, it's SharePoint Online, and then it's Link Online, which is, uh, is our unified communications uh, offering. So if you think about those offerings together, that's pretty much what companies are using when they think of collaboration, and when they think of Office, those are the types of tools that, that companies are using. If you think about the value of Office 365 to organizations, um, you can think of it in terms of the best productivity experience. Uh, you, you have the ability to simultaneously, yes, simultaneously edit documents with your colleagues. You can do conduct uh, online meetings with your colleagues, your partners. You can share your, your uh, documents, your task lists, your schedules on team sites, and all of these things that you think of when you think of SharePoint. These are the types of of capabilities that you think of when you think of SharePoint and Office together. So productivity is definitely an area where we focus and Microsoft is unparalleled in being able to bring this to the market. In terms of anywhere access, it really does mean being able to access this information uh, on your phone, access information on uh, your tablet, access information on your PC, your netbook, your notebook, your desktop computer, uh, a browser, what have you. So this anywhere access is really very important and really allows uh, organizations to be flexible. Um, in fact, uh, bring your own browser. Uh, it doesn't have to be Internet Explorer. We support multiple different kinds of, of, of uh, browsers. Um, same with the phones. Access your mail, your contacts your SharePoint sites uh, from Windows phones, of course, from Nokia, from Android, from iPhone, from BlackBerry. So those devices are all included in this as well. So really broad range of accessibility um, and uh, the ability to get to your information from anywhere that you might be and any form factor you might have. And then we want to think about what works for you. Um, you know, People understand Word and Excel and PowerPoint. Why? Because they use it at home. Uh, it, we offer, Microsoft offers the uh, Home and Student Editions, which comes with uh, Word and PowerPoint and Excel, and it's very popular. Um, and it comes with three licenses that you can have on all your computers, and so your kids can have it, you can have it on your personal computer at home. Um, people are using those things at home. People are used to it from previous employers. So it's ubiquitous in terms of the familiarity with the interface. It just works. And so minimal user training because people are already using those types of interfaces. And then we, we want to think about 
enterprise security and reliability, this, there's the, uh, the pretty known fact that Microsoft is pretty well attacked. Um, and really, you know, we just don't have that much in the way of downtime and uh, we don't have that much in the way of security issues. It's, it's a pretty powerful offering when you think of it because we have premium anti-spam and antivirus protection that's uh, provided uh, across multiple virus scanning engines in our data centers. Uh, your data is replicated in geo-redundant data centers to protect against data center-wide failures. There's some pictures that I deleted out of this of what our data centers look like. And here's a pretty generic one looking down a hallway, but we're doing some pretty advanced things with the data centers, including having data centers that are on a truck and you literally take the container truck into a field with lots of power and lots of phone lines and data lines and you plug it in. And there's these arrays of buildings with these trucks inside of them. And, uh, and that's our data centers. Um, it's really pretty amazing to see. And you, you can go online onto the Microsoft website and see some of those things. So enterprise security, reliability, and we do offer a 99.9 .9 financially backed SLA. Um, if it goes down uh, and goes down for certain periods, it is financially backed um, service level agreement that we provide. Um, and then if you think about IT control and efficiency, um, the ability from a very easy interface to manage your users, to manage and provision sites, no different than if you were doing it on-prem using the same types of resources and the same user interfaces that your IT pros are used to using in provisioning these uh, sorts of users in, in an exchange site or uh, provisioning SharePoint sites. And so this, uh, this idea of familiarity transcends the end user but also includes the IT pro as well. So the IT control and efficiency is definitely one of the parts of the value of Office 365 that really is unparalleled in the industry. So if you think about the customers, this is a really cool slide. If you think about the customers that have embraced cloud productivity, Office 365 uh, with Microsoft, and you look at this slide and you realize this is not all inclusive, um, that's pretty powerful. Um, but then if you think about the percentage of those um, organizations that are related to life sciences in one way or another, uh, that becomes even more impressive. Uh, you think of companies like Novartis and GSK and Siemens and Philips. Those are life sciences companies that have that have are using Office 365. If you think of ones that are more expansive in the related food and, and FDA related industries, you think of uh, Coca-Cola Enterprise or Kraft Foods, those are using Office 365. If you think of the ones that are even further related might be in ag sciences or in plant and animal science. Um, you think of Dow, you think of DuPont, those are on Office 365. And the scientists are collaborating using Office 365 in those areas. And go further, think of the universities, the higher education, the scientists there that are utilizing SharePoint and Exchange for collaboration using Office 365 that becomes even more interesting. So you look at this slide, you look at the ones that are circled and say, wow, those are life science and science-related organizations that have embraced Microsoft's cloud productivity. And you realize that the life science-related industry is the top industry that is using Office 365 at this point. Pretty impressive, frankly, and something that we're really proud of. So if you think about what's in Office 365, um, you know, what are the offerings in there? We talk about Office and Exchange and SharePoint and Link. Yeah, sure, okay, but what do they do? Uh, Office gives you this whole capability around having both a desktop version of your uh, Office client, things that you are running on today, or you can use those Office web apps and actually use and edit documents in a browser and be able to utilize those in the browser, in the cloud, that's pretty powerful. 
uh, if you think about Exchange, Exchange is not your email. It's also voicemail with unified messaging. You can do integrated personal archiving. You can do retention policies. You have legal hold, a cross-premises management, and all of those uh, capabilities. And then this one is interesting, free and busy coexistence with Link Online. So now you can have uh, your calendar driving your link and your link client to show that you are actually busy at any given point in time. You don't have to change the status. It changes because you're in a meeting. Um, really powerful. The SharePoint Online, uh, SharePoint has become uh, one of the top selling pieces of software of all time. Uh, and in the top uh, pharmas in the country, 100% of them are using SharePoint at this point. Um, and so some of the things that you think of there, um, the capabilities that you've come to know and love inside of SharePoint are absolutely available in the SharePoint Online. And then finally, Link Online is our newest offering. It used to be Office Communicator, and now it's our unified communications is Link Online. And it provides IM and presence, so being able to say if you're busy, if you're on the phone, what have you, IM and presence across firewalls. You can do things like you know, the GAL or the global address list and skill uh, set search in SharePoint. Um, it's driven from Exchange, of course. You can do online meetings with desktop sharing. You can do activity feeds. We have something in Microsoft called the Office Talk, and you can do those sorts of activity feeds. So there's really very powerful capabilities uh, in Link Online for doing unified uh, communications. And then we come to the fun part, of course, is, all right, so given all that, what would it be possible to do with Office 365 in a life science company? And you can think about it. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have shared documents, if you have OneNote, if you have uh, information that you want to store centrally, what are the sorts of things that you could actually do with that? Well, you could have electronic lab notebooks. You could have more multi-organization collaboration. Um, and, and that's in the R&D space. If you think about development, you can do team collaboration, project management, uh, multimedia training, task tracking. Uh, if you think about uh, manufacturing and supply chain, dashboards, intelligence, uh, data aggregation for Six Sigma purposes. Um, and then you think of the sales and marketing sp uh, space, and you think of marketing materials management or brand launch management, which is a project. Um, co-marketing and licensing marketing management, or even M&A development. Now, how could you do that? Security is really important. And then the ability in SharePoint Online, just like in SharePoint on-prem, you can put permissions on documents individually through a document library, such that those documents are locked down. Uh, and they're only visible to the people who have the rights to be able to see them and open them. So, all sorts of capabilities, we're starting to see people use these beyond just basic team collaboration, but actually starting to think of ways of using SharePoint and Office 365 in a more vertical specific way. So that leads us, however, to the question of compliance. And, uh, you know, we are doing some uh, efforts around platform qualification for Office 365. And of course, you know, the most important one is we do have industry standard um, SQA processes and procedures to the point that we have done ISO 27001 certification. We've done SAS 70 Type 2 certification. We'll even sign a HIPAA BAA or business associate agreement. And so those are the things that we have done to date. Remember, validation in the case of Part 11 or GXP, or any of the above, a HIPAA, what have you, validation of the application is really up to the end user. So if you configure a workflow and you have that workflow doing specific things, um, the validation of that workflow is really up to you since you configured it. So validation is up to the end user and the use of the software according to your own SOPs, according to your own requirements. However, qualification of of the platform is a responsibility of the hosting and software provider. We have to provide you qualification up to what you need for your validation efforts. And so the question is, you know, 
how far does Microsoft go? Is, is it sufficient? And this is be completely transparent. This is something that we're working through within Microsoft. Is ISO 27001, SAS 70 Type 2, the HIPAA BAA, have, have those things that we've done so far, are they in aggregate sufficient to then go ahead and build Part 11 applications, Part 11 compliant applications on top of uh, that, that level of qualification? Um, and so some questions that we're, we're going through and asking our customers, how important is a third-party GSP or Part 11 qualification audit to your organization? If you're going to do a validated app, if that's the next kind of, uh, if that's the next evolution of your use of Office 365, is that a necessity? Uh, and so, you know, we did a poll, and a poll of our current customers found that GXP-specific qualification really wasn't of high importance, and that the current qualifications were sufficient for, for their needs. So, you know, what do you think? If, if you have a specific uh, comment on that, I actually encourage you to send it to me. You can send it to me at that email address that is there, or we can engage in the, the discussion on the LinkedIn that will be set up after this webinar. So some important, really, kinds of questions that uh, we're working on uh, within Microsoft in order to be able to solve the, or not solve, but in order to be able to serve uh, the needs of our customers. And so yeah, we do continuously invest in this service. And we are, we ask these questions because we do make regular changes. Um, and, you know, it's something that's important to us because we do have enterprise credibility. We do have that rich and familiar capability. And we think we have the most compelling vision for bringing all of those capabilities together. And so what do you need to do? You can go to office365.com. You can download a 30-day evaluation of Office 365 and see if it's right for you. And if it is, then engage with uh, your Microsoft account manager, uh, your life science team. Uh, you can, can engage with uh, other organizations uh, like U.S. Data Management, and we can start to move forward with your engagement around Office 365. And so with that, I thank you, and I'll turn it back over. Excuse me. Uh, thank you so much, Les. Uh, that was extremely informative. Um, hang on. I'll take seize control here. It's all about control, isn't it, in the life sciences? Anyway. Um, uh, as some of you may know, I've, I've talked about this topic before. Um, you know, I have an earlier recorded webinar, uh, which can be found on our uh, US Data Management website. If you have any issues getting into it, just let me know or uh, let Jeff or Becky know from our team, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pass that information on to you. Um, and I'd covered two, two case studies. Uh, kind of uh, uh, one of them was a very critical uh, high GXP system, high compliance score system, and uh, you know, we wanted the, uh, the hosting provider to really do some qualification work, or the customer really wanted the uh, hosting provider to do some qualification work, very similar to what Les was talking about a little earlier. Uh, but I'm going to quickly talk about a particular uh, case study uh, where, the, uh, where the application wasn't so high on the compliance score, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit and, uh, and some, of the, uh, some of the things that we did. Um, so <clears throat> ultimately, I think uh, uh, life sciences is all about risk. It is all about um, whether you do it on-premises, whether you do it um, on the cloud, there's some inherent risk. Uh, there are a lot of list risks that we take in validating on-premises systems today. Uh, if you truly want to do a thorough validation of any on-premises software or qualify, 100% qualify the underlying infra infrastructure that it sits on, uh, we'd be spending anywhere from two to ten times the cost of the software package itself or maybe even more. Um, so we already do um, take a risk-based approach. Uh, going to the cloud essentially just opens up some new uh, different challenges um, uh, opens up some new risks that merely need to be assessed and suitably mitigated. Um, you know, uh, the cloud is not going away. Uh, you know, 15 years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, a year from now, uh, we're going to have more and more uh, cloud adoption and less and less on-premises adoption. We all know that. Uh, the question is how how best do we handle it? Um, and of course, risk is a risk is a very subjective thing. 
Um, there, there may be some of you in this audience who, who are bungee jumpers. I'm not. Uh, you don't think bungee jumping is a very uh, a risky affair. Uh, I would think it's a super, super risky affair. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of falling down from somewhere. So, um, uh, you know, risk is very subjective. Uh, I'll also give you a particular example. Uh, I was working with uh, two uh, sister companies uh, of a large pharma company. One was a sterile manufacturing facility, and one was a uh, over-the-counter, uh, you know, OTC drug manufacturing company. Logic would make you think that um, the sterile manufacturing uh, facility would, would tend to take fewer risks. Their validation standards would be higher. But in this particular scenario, these two sister companies, it was, it was the other way around. And the reason it was the other way around was the, uh, the OTC company was frequently dinged uh, by the FDA in the past uh, you know, five years or so for some violations. So the FDA auditors would be super, super aggressive and super, super rig rigorous about their audits. The sterile manufacturing facility have always had a, st a stellar um, a record, so they would use a lot more risk-based approaches to validation, risk-based approaches to qualification of their infrastructure, even on their shop floor as well. So uh, risk is very subjective. It varies from company to company. It varies from department to department. Obviously, you know, uh, regulatory compliance and quality people are going to be quite risk-averse. Uh, the IT folks and engineers uh, are probably you know want to implement new technology and are uh, uh, you know uh, welcome risk and welcome change, uh, but there's a reason for QA and RC to be uh, risk averse because uh, technically you know it does open up a can of worms and they want to make sure that uh, um, you know compliance standards are adhered to so they uh, you know they're in it, they have every right to uh, to question and uh, prod and. Uh, uh, and prick and make sure that uh, all the compliance loose ends are tied up. <clears throat> risk assessments, of course, we also use it. Um, you know, we've called it GXP. I think some customers call it GXP assessments. Um, it, you know, you, it also allows us to kind of identify a compliance score for the system. Any system that's close to uh, product quality or close to the product or close to the quality management system of the, of the company uh, is typically has a, a much higher compliance score than, than something that's lower down the, uh, 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 the compliance food chain. Um, risk assessments, are, of course, are also used to, uh, to kind of identify critical GXP uh, components of your system. Uh, for example, ERP. Um, would you validate 100% uh, of your ERP system? No, you wouldn't. I mean, there's a lot of financial stuff that you, you probably would not touch. I mean, you may need to touch it from the SOX perspective, but from a GXP perspective, you may not really want to be involved in validating every every single component. Uh, and there may be some specific data points that are, are more GXP critical than, than others, and you want to focus your efforts and your energies in, in validating those critical components of your system. So your risk assessment really, really helps you, uh, helps you to do that. Uh, let's talk about the traditional you know, validation paradigm, right? Uh, and I'm going to try and, and draw here to the best of my ability. It's usually kind of top-down. Uh, you know, we start with the, the validated application layer. Um, you know, we build requirement spec. This is your, your application that sits at the top. This is your application, your ERP application, your CRM application, your content management application, uh, your regulated submissions management system or whatever, your application that sits on top of, uh, of an infrastructure. Um, and we're all familiar with the validation concepts of this, uh, you know, requirements, design, and test protocols, etc. cetera. Um, the VAL application, of course, typically now these days sit on virtual machines that sit on a virtual infrastructure, uh, you know, and we qualify those. Uh, I apologize for these horrible, horrible drawings here on, my, on the screen. Um, I'm not very good with the mouse. Um, and we qualify the virtual infrastructure as well so that we can support um, all of the requirements of, of the application uh, or the requirements that the application has of the virtual infrastructure. We qualify that. Uh, we have uh, deployment procedures. We have expansion procedures. How do we add a new host? How do we add new virtual machines, et cetera, et cetera? So we, we cover that. And then, of course, the virtual infrastructure layer sits on a physical infrastructure layer. It sits on a SAN. It sits on uh, ESX, ESXi host boxes. It sits on uh, the network itself. The network provides connectivity. Etc. Uh, you know, security, active, you know, active directory, things like that. So we qualify each of these uh, infrastructure services uh, that are provided as a service 
to the validated application and in turn to the end user. And uh, each of these infrastructure services obviously also has uh, um, yeah, you know, high, medium, low compliance score and whatnot because you know, security in Active Directory obviously has a greater score than, um, uh, than, than the, you know, the cables and switches and network, uh, the, the routing equipment, et cetera. Uh, the traditional paradigm, you can also think of it in a slightly different way. Uh, if you think of compliance as a pyramid, uh, you have the validated app at the top. Uh, you're all familiar with that. Um, that sits on an infrastructure that is qualified, and all of this is supported by uh, your QMS, your quality management system, your processes and procedures, etc. So, uh, you know, you build a compliance framework and foundation with, with processes and procedures at the bottom. On top of that, you layer your qualified infrastructure, which is, which is the foundation for the applications that sit on top of it. You validate the applications, and then you're, you, know, you, you provide that application to your, uh, to your users. So, so, so the challenge is how do you translate this, uh, this, this paradigm to the cloud? Um, you know, there are different kinds of uh, cloud or hosting models. Uh, you know, some, some vendors just provide infrastructure as a service where uh, you, <coughs> excuse me, you only have uh, uh, the infrastructure, anything all the way up to the operating system that's provided to you as a customer, and you build your application on top of it. And uh, like Les mentioned earlier, you know, they're responsible all the way up to the infrastructure to make sure that it's qualified, and uh, you are focused on the application that you build, and you validate the application that you build. Uh, but also, um, in certain cases where the application itself is provided as a service, um, you know, classic examples, you know, uh, uh, you know, SharePoint itself is provided as a service in Office 365, Salesforce, uh, you know, you can just go on demand and uh, uh, software, provide software as a service. Uh, and even here, you can have multiple layers. Um, you can have uh, multi-tenant or single tenant, and there are various flavors in these. You know, you can have a multi-tenant application with a, uh, with a dedicated single tenant database that's provided for each customer, or you can have a multi-tenant application with a multi-tenant database, or um, uh, in certain uh, very, very crucial high-risk cases, you have a single tenant, um, uh, single uh, database uh, instance that's provided for a customer. <laughs> of course, on a compliance risk scale, uh, you know, multi-tenant, multi-database is probably opens up more cans of worms than a single tenant and single database, but there are, you know, pros and cons uh, you have to weigh when you make those decisions. So I'm going to kind of talk, to, talk about a particular case study uh, where the system was like a middle-of-the-road compliance score system. Uh, uh, in this example, it was a CRM system where certain calls, uh, 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 you know, uh, certain very specific calls triggered some GXP uh, transactions or adverse events, and that was escalated to an on-premise adverse event system. But certain other routine calls, they just had to, you know, they had to stay on top of who called when, um, you know, a ticket management kind of a, uh, a, a system. Uh, but the operators, of course, used the call information to make some GXP decisions, whether it was to be escalated to the on-premises uh, 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 GXP systems or not. So, you know, the uh, QARC group uh, for this company decided it was, it was important to validate the system. Uh, however, the, you know, the compliance score was a lot lower. Uh, than some of the uh, the more sh you know patient safety product related systems for this customer. <clears throat> uh, an important note, I do talk about that uh, uh, the challenges of a high compliance score system and our approach for that as well. And it's there in an earlier webinar, and I'm going to uh, uh, dive in depth on it in a future webinar as well. So uh, watch, look out for that. <clears throat> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, of course, uh, this is just a more interesting case study. Um, as we could easily take the system to the cloud, so and, and it's much more easier to discuss a, a scenario like this. Uh, the vendor provided a uh, multi-tenant application tier and a single-tenant database tier, meaning um, the database was, uh, was specifically dedicated to the customer, um, and the vendor was, uh, was a quality shop. Uh, they were SAS 70 Type 2 certified, very, uh, uh, you know, very similar to uh, uh, what Les was mentioning earlier with uh, you know, the Microsoft uh, hosting centers, et cetera. They had a solid quality management program in place. Uh, they had very well-defined IT operations, including a very strong 
change control process and a, and a configuration management process. Of course, the change control um, process wasn't as rigorous as you would probably have it at your, at your own facilities, but it was a robust change management process where every change was well analyzed and uh, a good impact assessment was done and followed through, et cetera. Uh, and the vendor was also really very open to an audit and an assessment and were, uh, were very eager to please um, eager to fix recommendations uh, that you know we found in the audit. Uh, data security and customer security was very important to the vendor, and they had several controls, um, logical and physical, to ensure security. Um, but uh, I remember we found some procedural issues. Uh, they had some um, some gaps with respect to revoking access, and uh, we encouraged them to uh, actually not encourage them. We kind of twisted their arm to. Uh, um, to tie up on their uh, on the procedural controls aspects of it, and uh, the the vendor worked with us to enhance uh, their processes and procedures, etc. The uh, the vendor furthermore kind of provided us a 60 day notice. Um, they had a uh, they provided us with three environments, I believe, if I remember this correctly. Uh, we we had a stage, a test, and a prod. Um, so a stage or a sandbox. Uh, so these. Uh, you know, changes were staged to stage and then to test and to finally to prod, I think. And they gave us a 60-day notification for any changes that happened on the application tier. Uh, the customer, of course, was still ultimately responsible for validation and not the vendor. And uh, there was some strong uh, uh, service level agreements in place uh, uh, to ensure that they provided us ad adequate documentation on the changes that happened, especially or specifically to the application tier. <clears throat> with detailed uh, you know, uh, release notes and uh, the IT service management tickets that they had or their change management tickets that they had, et cetera. The infrastructure, however, was not qualified. Uh, in, you know, uh, one of the things that the QARC organi organization wanted was, the, was that the infrastructure be qualified to their own internal standards, and uh, the vendor uh, you know, could not meet that specific standard. Uh, and the customer, another uh, huge risk issue was that the customer did not notify, uh, uh, sorry, the vendor did not notify the customer of infrastructure uh, changes, meaning uh, say they, had, they, you know, they had to completely revamp their SAN and they're currently on uh, EMC SAN, whatever, and they want to go to NetApp. Those would be changes that would happen at the back end uh, without anybody being notified of it. Of course, any change to the application tier would be notified. So this was another uh, huge risk area that we identified in the risk assessment, and we had to come up with something um, uh, to, to create a good mitigation strategy. <clears throat> I think I skipped a slide in advance, but anyway. So, uh, so, so we let's talk about some of the uh, some of the typical lifecycle deliverables that you, you, most of you are familiar with, and how they applied to uh, uh, to this cloud space. Um, so. You know, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, there was a, uh, a, a val plan and a risk assessment. Uh, it addressed all of these, identified all of these risk areas that I talked about uh, earlier. It also identified some key Part 11 issues. Um, the system, the CRM system, had interfaces to on-premise, some on-premises systems. Uh, there were some database triggers, et cetera, that pushed data back and forth, et cetera. Um, and plus the user's access to systems through the cloud, through the internet, so through the World Wide Web, it was you know, considered an open system, and we, we addressed some of uh, those Part 11 uh, issues as well. And I'm going to talk about that in brief a little later. Uh, the vendor was audited. Uh, it was a very thorough assessment. Um, certifications, you know, the ISO, SAS 70 Type 2, um, and all of the details on the SLA, you know, the disaster recovery and backup and data security. Uh, more importantly, their internal audit processes were also checked. You know, how did they audit themselves? Um, and I think one of the findings were, uh, that we found was it wasn't that adequate, and we asked them to beef it up, and uh, their own internal QA, uh, you know, should audit their processes more often, et cetera, and, and, and they, they agreed to do so. Of course, all of this, uh, you know, translated to costs uh, to the end customer, but these were something that were very important to the uh, 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 to the end customer, and the costs uh, and the benefits of going to the cloud far mitigate far uh, exceeded the uh, 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 the benefits of having them uh, having the software on premises. So uh, we still went ahead anyway. Uh, I think there's another issue in this audit was that. Uh, 
and, and I think we're still working on negotiating this, is the extent of training that needs to happen with the people who are operating uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the servers, etc., how much GXP and Part 11 training, and we're in the middle of that negotiation, so I don't want to get into that uh, anymore, uh, any more than that. Um, and uh, their security aspects, and I think I mentioned that really briefly, they had some very, very strong security controls, but their procedural side was a little weak, and uh, uh, we were working, uh, you know, we worked with them to enhance that. So uh, the output of the vendor assessment, of course, uh, forced us to modify the risk assessment as well because we identified some new risks uh, that came out of the, of the vendor assessment. And, and, and this isn't a waterfall approach. It isn't like we wrote a document and we never visited it, visited it again. Uh, you know, the risk assessment was a working document and it was uh, updated throughout the life cycle. Uh, then subsequently requirements, I'm not going to dwell into that. Uh, everybody knows what requirement specs are. Um, we also built uh, design documents specific uh, uh, to the, uh, the customization specific to the customer, like uh, you know the custom fields, the custom workflows, uh, the custom feature sets that were turned on, etc. Uh, specifically, their database schema. Uh, uh, how did they interface with the, the customers? Uh, 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 internal applications like the network and, uh, and the other application that I was talking to you about. So uh, the design spec was very, very focused on the differences or the customizations uh, unique to the customer. Uh, and we also had a, a strong, verif you know, we documented the SLAs as part of the validation package as well. And uh, these were something that were either verified in the IQs or the OQs where we either verified that uh, um, these processes were in place in the audit, they were checked in the audit, or they were checked in some kind of a test. Um, so the IQ, uh, you know, mostly verified all of the design elements and some of the uh, SLA uh, portions of it. And the, uh, the OQPQ uh, really uh, focused on testing the requirements. Um, we did a lot of negative testing, testing of the interfaces, and uh, we really uh, laid emphasis on on security verifications and, and, and uh, the data transfers between this system and the other applications on premises. <clears throat> um, one thing I really want to kind of highlight is the smoke test or uh, system suitability test. I know that you know system suitability sounds like a lab systems uh, uh, terminology, but essentially uh, uh, we built a mi minimum set of regression uh, test scripts. Um, which tested some IQ functions, like um, made sure that the configurations were uh, were the same as they were when this was done earlier. Some sample OQ and PQ tests using some dummy data. Uh, there's a reason for this, and uh, this will, this will start to get clear as I uh, go down this presentation. Um, we also automated the smoke test using uh, HP Quality Center, um, and uh, we we set up uh, uh, we set this up. Um, we established the smoke test and uh, made that as a gold standard. And I'm going to kind of walk you through as to why in a bit. Uh, we also addressed um, uh, Part 11 uh, implications uh, beyond, you know, the usual audit trail, security, e-signature, data integrity, and all of that. We also had to address the fact that this is an open system. It had some traffic. Um, between it and uh, you know other applications on premises, so we you know that that had to be encrypted, uh, and uh, you know that had to be built into the requirements and, and subsequently tested, etc. So uh, I, I know I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that we did address that uh, as part of the risk assessment. <clears throat> the key, uh, one of the key uh, findings of the risk assessment was. Uh, you know, it's really easy to kind of validate this application because you have it. It's there somewhere. It's not moving. It's not a moving object. You've, you've completed validating it. But unfortunately, it's sitting on somebody else's uh, machines, somebody else's facility, somebody else's data center, and there are changes that are happening there. Some of it is communicated to you. Some of it isn't. So it could be a moving target. So uh, this was a, a, a huge sticking point, and we needed to come up with a way to address this. Uh, and the risk assessment identified this as a uh, as an as a as a crucial risk that needed to be mitigated. So, um, you know, customers were notified of any impending changes, um, especially on the application tier, and they had 60, uh, you know, 60-day notice. 
Uh, but still, we had a very short window to test those releases, so the customer's change control process had to be very nimble. So let's kind of walk through a few scenarios, right? And uh, uh, I'm going to kind of talk about why that smoke test that I mentioned earlier, um, and just to sort of refresh your memory, uh, this little smoke test uh, is going to be very crucial in our uh, risk mitigation strategy for this particular customer. So scenario one, vendor makes a change to the application that does not affect the customer or it does not affect uh, GXP or high criticality modules, meaning it doesn't affect the application adversely. Say it's a workflow, uh, you know, say it's, it's, it's a cosmetic enhancement or, or something that's completely unrelated to the application itself. Um, or it's, you know, uh, say that in a SharePoint example, you know, they say there are you know, five different types of workflow and the sixth workflow that nobody's using, this customer isn't using, and that's going to be tweaked or changed uh, to provide uh, additional functionality to some other customers, but it doesn't affect us at all, uh, it would be, a, would be a classic example. So, um, so the vendor is making this change, and uh, so as part of our change control process that we developed for this customer, we, uh, we run the smoke test. As soon as the change is made, we run the smoke test. Um, it's automated as well, so that kind of saves us some money, uh, so we don't have to manually test this, etc. So if the test passes, no further action necessary, right? If the test fails, then we do some investigation as to why the test failed. So that means even though the vendor claimed that there was a no change to your application, well, well uh, our test uh, results tells us that there was a change to, the, uh, 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 to our application. So, you know, you trigger a cap or a change control and try to investigate further as to why that happened. Um, another, <coughs> excuse me, another uh, uh, aspect of the smoke test was we had, uh, I think, a two-monthly schedule, or I think once, in a, once a quarter schedule, sorry, to run the smoke test uh, periodically. This was run because we wanted to, we had no visibility on uh, on infrastructure changes that are happening because that, that's a black box to the customer. So we wanted to make sure that uh, on an ongoing basis, every quarter we're running the smoke test to make sure that our application still uh, 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 um, you know stands up to the challenge, right? So you know we can feel confident that whatever the, the vendor is doing at the back end is not really affecting my application. Um, you know, additionally, we, we uh, you know beyond GXP, I think we also had some performance benchmarking tests in the uh, in that smoke test because uh, you know there were some stringent SLA requirements um, on performance and uh, and things of that nature. <clears throat> Let's talk about scenario two. The vendor makes a change uh, that directly affects uh, the customer's application or, uh, or or you know GXP or high criticality modules. So, you know, they've sent you those release notes. You know that this change is coming 60 days in advance, so we plan for it. Um, so, and we also have it in the staging environment and the uh, testing environment, so we can actually test against it. So, um, a change control is triggered, you know, specs are updated, test scripts are created, very, very, very similar to what you, you've all experienced in your day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, and the smoke test, if it's affected, it's also created or it's updated. Scenario three, uh, customer change makes a change to the application customization. So, uh, uh, so the customer controls parts of the application, like for example, they, they control the way a particular workflow works, then they tweak it. It's very similar to something that they would have controlled in-house. Uh, a change control is triggered, you do an impact assessment, figure out what, you know, what documents need updating, uh, and what the extent of testing you need, et cetera. And uh, if the smoke test is affected, you update the smoke test as well. <coughs> So in summary, uh, you know, uh, I think I've already way past, shot past the half hour, but, uh, you know, the risk assessment was really key uh, to going to the cloud for this customer. Uh, and, you know, what are the strategies we use to, to handle some of the compliance risks or exposures of going over the cloud? Just like I said earlier, uh, whether you do it on-premises or you go over the cloud, you have certain uh, risks that you need to mitigate. So you just have to be... Uh, you, you have to be smart about coming up with good ways that can be defended uh, to mitigate those risks. Sometimes um, the vendor's uh, audit com you know, proves to be quite horrible, and uh, you may not take that risk. But in, in any case, uh, you know, the risk assessment is key. The vendor assessment is also extremely key because it either boosts our confidence and our morale, 
or uh, you know, and, and it mitigates some of the risks that we may have identified, or it opens up a few extra risks or a, a new kind of worm that we have to you know, make some kind of a decision whether it's a go or no go as a vendor, or uh, we have to come up with new ways to mitigate certain risks. Um, so uh, also in summation, uh, you know, when, you, when you do go this route, be, be uh, wary of not just going in, but uh, uh, you also have to worry about how you're going to get out, meaning um, your service level agreements, uh, uh, et cetera, you know, are all catered towards how the data is managed when you go in, but you also have to worry about, hey, you know, a year from now we decide to go a different platform, um, what's our exit strategy? So that's something that you have to, you have to really start negotiating very early in the game. Uh, and I think more to come in future webinars, and uh, I'm going to kind of open the floor to some questions. I see a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, the question is from Mark. Um, you say we audit the vendor. How can we be sure that the vendor is still holding the same high standards two, three years later? Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, this actually came up in the risk assessment as well. And uh, one thing we did was a periodic audit schedule, meaning uh, we, I, I think it was a once in two years or once a year annual audit. Uh, you know, uh, we weren't really satisfied with just the initial song and dance. We wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the vendor continues to provide good, strong, solid service. Um, you know, the management might change, uh, their, their practices might change. You want to make sure you want to stay on top of the vendor by auditing them periodically. And depending on the risk score or your compliance score of your system, you may want to do that once a year, once in two years. Uh, it's purely driven by your risk assessment and the uh, uh, and the contract uh, that you have. A uh, question from Colin: Should you validate HP Quality Center if you're using it for 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 testing this app? Um, yes, you should uh, because you're using HP Quality Center to make some critical compliance decisions. Uh, compliance decisions that tell you whether you have to, you know, have they made a change to your system or uh, whether it is, uh, 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 you know, you have to address uh, with a kappa or a change control, et cetera. So you should uh, qualify HPQC. Um, Venkat is asking, how can we perform regression tests? Do we perform it on the production environment? And uh, would there be some issues with that? Um, there were two things that we, two strategies that we, we suggested and we went with. One was uh, we suggested that they uh, test everything out in the test environment, uh, essentially your pre-prod or your val environment. And another uh, uh, option is to have some dedicated dummy data in your prod environment for your testing. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, either approaches work and, you know, you guys have to make the best call based on the use of your system. Uh, Mark again on the vendor audit thing. Um, what if the vendor does not do well in an audit? What steps can we take? Um, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, purely depends on how badly the vendor did, or actually more specifically, what what specific uh, drawbacks or failings they had. Uh, I guess also depends on how much they're willing to fix. Uh, uh, and, and, and meet you uh, and fix, you know, fix the issues that you found in your findings. Uh, and also depends on if you, you are comfortable taking on the risk of the vendor being a poor quality shop, uh, you know, what will you do to mitigate it, right? So it all boils down to that. Uh, sorry, it's not a very uh, straightforward answer, but uh, I need to know some more specifics, and maybe we can just discuss that a little offline. Uh, what about... Cloud vendors that don't allow customer audits, example Amazon. Uh, that's also very, that's an interesting question. Um, it's uh, again boils, and this is a recurring theme in my in my responses, I think, and as well as my presentation. It all boils down to risk. Uh, you know, you, perhaps you can twist their arms if it's really viable for them. They'll you know they'll they'll do it for you. If it's a low enough risk, it's a, a, a you know low compliance score system, and you you know you don't particularly care, and you can come up with some innovative mitigation strategies like I talked about. Um, you know you you could probably get away with it. Uh, perhaps you know you can replicate the data to your own data center, and which kind of defeats the purpose of having something on the cloud in the first place. Um, so it, it purely depends. I mean, uh, for all of these questions, I think you kind of go back to risks. 
um, you identify your risk and figure out if if going over the cloud makes sense for you and uh, it, it keeps your uh, your internal RC and QA people happy with the risk mitigation strategies that you have, which in turn will mean that they have to stand and defend it in front of the authorities. So they need to feel, com they need to feel comfortable about defending such a stance. So uh, if you use your risk assessment as your main key document or your negotiating tool, um, then uh, uh, you can't go wrong. So you can, you, know, you, you can work off of that. I think we're close to 1 o'clock, so I'm going to uh, close questions for now. Uh, I'm going to gather all the questions that you've sent and uh, individually continue to respond on our, uh, on our LinkedIn uh, discussion board, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll have uh, Becky or myself send you uh, a link to that, to all the attendees. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we trust that the information shared was helpful. Uh, we welcome any co comments or feedback. Uh, we're also open, you know, we're very open to continual improvement of this uh, of this forum. Um, we encourage you to join the discussion on LinkedIn and, uh, and you know, visit our website to review topics of up upcoming webinar events across uh, all of the various uh, practices. On behalf of the USDM team, we appreciate the opportunity to team with you to discuss uh, such uh, compliance and IT matters in the life sciences. Thanks and have a good day.